Kids like the rap, huh? You have to you have to go with the times to change the bait to go after the generation. And as I was telling the our church last week, you know, there's four gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, written to four different type of people. And uh, Mark being the Roman era, and we are the new Roman era. That's the generation we are living in in the Western culture. Matthew being written to the Jews, because the Jews are not going to listen to anybody else unless you're a Jew. And so they're more detailed, and they want, you know, the background. The Romans were more into power and action, and they're impatient like Western culture today. And they want to get to the point. Get to the point, show me some action. Luke, written to the Greeks, more philosophers, more smart people. And then John is written to everybody else. And generally, when I have new people, I tell them to go to John first because uh, John basically speaks about who Jesus is, that Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God, is Son of God, but He's also God. God is three persons, okay? Elohim, God, is actually a plural word, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If you look at a family, my family, I have five people in my unit, if, you, if I can use that word. Five people, one family, you see? So if I say the family is doing this, it represents five people doing that. But there's five people within the family. And so within the Godhead, there is three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And when we say God... We, it is a plural word, and in the original translation, Elohim is a plural word. And so they don't use God's, you know, like in the English, because there's some confusion there, but, but it is a plural word, and you need to understand that there's three persons in the Godhead, right? Now, it's, it's, God is using this to help us understand him. There's a, it's a little bit more complicated, I think, beyond our own limitation. But um, what's been given to us is what you need to receive and accept. Beyond that is not your concern, okay? Sometimes people think about things that are, that are not your concern, you know? I mean, I, I had moments of where I should think about, you know, I had a thought like, okay, what if God didn't exist and what is nothing, how would nothing exist? You know, you just, you just baffle your mind and you go in a direction that's useless. And it's a waste of time. When you have so much to already learn and study that we're going to go on a tangent to learn or chase after useless information that has no bearing on the core message of salvation of who God is and who you are you know a lot of people are born and 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 that you're either raised in you know a good environment or a bad environment you can and you know in my family, we have a dog and a cat. We got rid of one cat because it was too shedding too much. But I was looking at the dog and the cat, and I was thinking, you know, there's millions of dogs and cats out there, right? But they got chosen to come into my family. Maybe this is a bad example, but I want you to understand this. That dog and that cat got chosen to be in our family and because of that they have a good life and then there's millions or thousands of other animals out there dogs domestic animals that are homeless or straying and and why do they get the short end of the stick or they get into an abusive family now if we escalate that and you think about it in terms of humans 
Why did you get picked to be born in, this, in a particular family, in a particular country? Because a lot of us, uh, we were able to be immigrated to the U.S. I came here when I was four. And if, you know, from Korea. And if you look at uh, Korea, North and South, you have North Korea, a population of 20 million or so, where most of them starve to death and are under severe oppression and persecution, while the South gets to experience liberation and freedom and prosperity in the last 50 years. Actually, my relatives, I heard, was from the North and they crossed over, and so because of that, I'm here. Why is it that I was able to get to this place in America now while someone else didn't? Is it fair? Is it fair? That's something you really don't need to go and think about. Because it's a question that is not within your pay grade. But if you start thinking about what's not fair for you, now you're going to end up judging God. And you're going to go on a tangent, and you're going to think about useless things, thinking that you can actually question God and judge him. You need to just be aware of what's on your own plate and be thankful that you are born where you've been born and what you know and what you've been given, that you've been given this opportunity and that you've been chosen into the ranks of God's kingdom for salvation. And you have a lot more than those people out there in the other world. And yet we're going to complain and, and, and we're going to have pity parties and we're going to, you know, get offended over useless things, get offended about, over whoever trying to discipline you, whether your parents or your pastors. And then we have a little ta uh, tantrum, right? We have a little tantrum. Why do we have a tantrum? Because no one's out there to kill you. That's why. You live in North, you, if you live in North Korea, you'd be like, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. But over here, you know, you're like, I got rice. Don't touch me. And you think you're free? If you're in the world, you're not free. You, you can go make some money and, you know, go get some, you know, boyfriends, girlfriends, go whatever. And is it really going to fill you? You're just going to go through an endless loop, right? So you got you to gotta really think about what's important. And be thankful for what's been given to you. It doesn't matter why you're here and they're not, or those other people. It doesn't matter why most of the people in the world is going to go to hell. You can't solve that issue. Some people don't believe it because they don't want to. Well, that's oh, uh, you're calling God a liar. You want to judge God for sending people to hell. Well, then you're judging God too, so that's your prerogative. But at the end of the day, you can't control your own breath. You can't control your own mortality. You can't control nothing. And therefore, at the end, you will, you will bow down before God and you will submit now or later. He is a king. And if you don't get that, you're going to have a miserable life. And if you bow down to the king, he's like, I'm going to give you life because I am life. Do you know you were created for him? And you were kidnapped at the Garden of Eden. And sin entered into the equation. And when sin entered the equation, your thought process, your personality, what is important to you, what looks good, got corrupted, thwarted. And so now we all fight for survival what's good for me and and we fight ferociously for this short period in life 
that most of us will only, if you're an American, you might be lucky to live 60, 70 years because the food system is poison. If you look at the centurions, if you know what that term is, it's the five areas around the globe. And there's one even in Loma, uh, I think it's Loma Linda, is that what they call it, right? And you know what the ironic thing is, they're all Seventh-day Adventists, right? Because they eat healthy. They live to 100. So whether you live short or long is based on what you eat and your health. But regardless, you, you, in America, you, you, we, have, we have little patience. So that's why like, the book of Mark maybe does well with Americans. Gets to the point, but still, you know, most Americans don't read the Bible. You should read the Bible. Because the Bible says in John, right, that the word it was is God. And if you say you know God, but you don't know the word, then you don't know God. It's that simple. God, God's son, came in the flesh. And he is the expression and the manifestation of the word. And so the word walked on the earth. And if you believe in the word, you shall have salvation. You know, God went to the cross to die for us. And most people don't understand what that means. It's, it's really a complicated thing. It is. Why does God have to go to the cross and die for me? What is all this, right? Like I said, you know, you have to first understand your purpose and why you are on this earth and why you are born. You were created for God. And when, he, when we got hijacked by the devil, he took, the devil took, you know, he conquered the land from Adam and Eve and we become cattle so that he can drag us to hell because Adam gave him the authority by, by the wife Eve listening to the serpent. You can turn the music down or off. And you have to understand how this works because you give up the authority of your life and all that is within you and your kids, your finances, your health. You give up that authority based on who you will obey if you listen to the devil you have given yourself and said i'm going to follow you devil if you listen to god you're listening to god but the problem is that if you listen to the devil once you're done right it's like that's what happened to even adam when they listened to him the one time now they've given their authority to him and now devil has taken control of the earth and that's why it's so important that if you think you hear God, you better be very cautious, you know. And, and because if it's not God and you think you're hearing God, then you're actually following the devil. And, and how do you know if um, you're following the devil? Well, when your life goes down the toilet, right? You think you hear God and all you hear is... I think I just heard a flush, but I thought it was God. But I'll try and see if it is God. And then you go, and what happens? You know, your life just keeps getting worse. That's why you want to be very careful before you claim that you hear God. Now, God can talk to people, but when your life is messed up, don't go around thinking that, you know, you, I hear God, I hear God. Okay, it's just your gas and diarrhea coming out. You don't even have read the Bible, and you're going to say, I hear God. I hear God. He's a lunatic. It's not funny for those who hear God, huh? <laughs> All right. I don't know why I'm going in that direction, but you need to hear it, I guess. We're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 18. And some of us haven't read about Elijah because we haven't read about the Old Testament. 
And you don't know why we call ourselves Fire of God Church. Because in the Bible, the Bible says that God is a consuming fire, not a lighter. But consuming. Wow. Okay. Not a lighter. Consuming as in he's going to consume you to see who you are. Because when fire comes at you and you start getting burned up, then you're not part of the fire. But when fire meets fire, right, it just flames together. All the impurity need to be burned away. So God, when, he, when, he, when you encounter God, your impurities are going to start shaking, right? The sin that the morality, the, all the bad things that don't belong there are going to start shaking and, you know, and you're going to want to run away because it's, it's, it's a strange feeling to you. You know, when you eat McDonald's and junk food, it tastes so good. You eat it for one week and it's like, this is my comfort food. McDonald's. French fry. You know, they, they soak that French fry in sugar. Okay, that's why it tastes so good. And they make it little, they put some whatever coating and it has this, uh, let me turn the fan down. Oh, can, uh, uh, yeah, can you hit the switch down? Oh, good. So, so when you eat it, it's like, ooh, yum, yum. I saw the food companies are marketing so you can become addicted, not so you can be healthy, right? That's how the capitalism works. Just keep on, I need you to consume, consume. And so you think like, oh, this tastes good, right? And then all of a sudden, after a couple of years, you got this beer belly going on, this sagging going on. Your blood pressure is out of control. You're about to have a heart attack. <laughs> so you go to the doctors and the pharmaceutical companies that are trying to, you know, sell you some pills. Instead of changing your diet, just take some pills, you know, the Bible, there's a term in there, fatten to the slaughter. And so then when you get lethargic, I don't want to read the Bible. I don't want to go to church. Let's watch some movies, though. <laughs> it's so exciting. You know, when you watch... Whether it's moving or your screen time, they, they put in what's called this blue light, right? And so, because when I used to grow up, we didn't have a phone, right, youngsters? There was no such thing as this. So we go out and play. That's why we normal, you not. <laughs> so you, you, this is your God, in a way. And so when you look at this constantly, blue light is emitting into your eyes and you're having overstimulation in your mind. And so now when you look at your phone and you try to sleep and you're like. <laughs> you know, your mind is racing and you're thinking, right? I'm telling you from experience, of course, because, you know, it's, it's, it's for all of us. I have thoughts and I'm, I, I have thoughts on, and then I'll start thinking about those thoughts, right? You have to choose to put it down, okay? It's, 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 it's with us, but you have to choose to put it down. And if you want to watch some nonsense, right? And then you wonder why your life is jacked up? It's based on what you see, okay? You're feeding yourself. You're feeding your soul, all right? And we talked about it last week, right? God says in the Bible, you need to circumcise your heart. Hmm? Okay, no, you don't know what that is? Should we demonstrate? <laughs> so when you watch nonsense, a foreskin covers your eyes. <laughs> you got to cut it. I'm only reiterating what the Bible says. You don't know what is in there, okay? It, it, can be, it can be heading towards rated R. All right, I better get back to the message. 
All right, let's go. Um, oh, yeah, okay. God's a consuming fire, all right? And uh, when Moses came out, okay, let me go a little back. We have new people. We have new people. You didn't just get saved. You didn't just find God. God was always watching you down through your DNA line. And when God touches you, you were always his people. You were just exiled for a while. And therefore, when you come to Christ, you've been called. You were Israel. The ten tribes of Israel were scattered after Solomon screwed it up. And so the ten tribes are assimilated into the world and their DNA is now spreading. This is how God's going to save the world. By allowing that DNA of his people to go around the world. And then after thousands of years, we all look like this. Different colors, different shape. Some got no hair. Some got a lot of hair. Some got big belly. Some got no belly. Some are smiling. Some look like they're lost. And so you were always his people. It's like, you know, if, when your parents were pregnant, they don't see you at that moment, but they already know you, right? They already know you. And so God says in the Bible, I knew you before you were even formed. If you spend some time trying to grasp this, maybe you'll be able to touch his heart. But most Christians, you know, you just, you just survival mode. You want something from the daddy, you know rather than who he is to you. And so he picked the physical Israel to show himself. And, but when they rejected Jesus, okay, because they did reject Jesus. Now, salvation is going to go back around to them, but because they rejected Jesus, salvation goes to the Gentiles, which is the lost ten tribes of Israel out there. To go find God's people. Because in the Bible it says, I will gather my people from all corners of the world. The outcast, the lame, the ones who can't walk and talk, like, you know, here. And he's going to restore his people, who are us. And you have to accept that by faith that you are his people. But we think too much, who am I? I've done so much. I've done so much bad things, blah, blah, blah. And, and you center your attention on you rather than on who he is. And that's why your thinking gets dwarfed because you think about yourself too much. When you place your thoughts on him, it's like, look, it's like a plant finally getting some sunlight. The plant don't need to look at itself. It just needs to bask in the sun. It gets healed, it starts growing, it's happy. Right? Just focus on the sun. And so, God takes his people out of Egypt with, through Moses, which represents a, a, a shadow of salvation. And so, you take them to Mount Sinai, and God is speaking on the mountains, Moses! And it says in the Bible that uh, he spoke from the heart of fire. So God is a consuming fire. And Jesus said in Luke 12, 4, 9, I wish fire was kindled already. So fire is God's presence. Now, some of you, most of you, know what that means and how that feels because we can actually impart God's fire to one another. And, and those who have been around the Pentecostal churches, and I want to use that term for reference, when you get consumed with, or when you have an encounter with God, you can actually be overwhelmed by his power and fall. You have experienced God moving even your bodies, and we pray in tongue, which is he's moving your tongue. And he can supernaturally heal you still. He can do many things. It's still all real, still. But you see in Rome, this new Roman era, you have too much backup. So your faith can't get completed. Because if you're sick, oh, there, I can go to the doctor. 
If you could, if there was no doctor and there was no medical, you will be on your knees out of desperation and you will experience God. But when you got EBT and medical, you'll give a half heart of faith to God and if he doesn't heal you, well, I just go to the doctor. And then we get used to that. God is real, and that's based on you, your faith. According to your faith, let it be done unto you. Amen? All right, let's start. Here's Elijah. God's fire is his signature. You know what that means, signature? Not is a signature, you know? You go to another church, you know, they talk about the word, but they might not have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of fire. As we talked the other week, you know, when, when there was John the Baptist, if you know John the Baptist, right? He preached repentance of water, baptism of water. And then Jesus comes on the scene. John has to die. Right? He's in the jail. Are you going to save me, Jesus? Jesus is like, no, I can't save you. You're going to die because your ministry is over and mine begins. You have to die so that people will focus on me and not you anymore. You have to sacrifice yourself. And so now we go moving into the Jesus age, and then Jesus has to die. Why does Jesus have to die? So he can send the Holy Spirit. But in Acts chapter 19, you know, the apostles come to a couple of other disciples and go, have you received the Holy Spirit? We don't even know what that means. You know, there's a lot of churches, even today, after 2,000 years, who's the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Lord. And Jesus had to die to forgive our sins and to send his Spirit so that he can be in the whole earth. Because as Jesus, in, as the Son of Man, he's very limited in his locality, right? He can't be everywhere at the same time. So he has to send the Spirit where the Spirit is everywhere now. So now we are in the, in the age of the Holy Spirit. And if you don't know the Holy Spirit, you are in trouble. You're still stuck in the par old paradigm, just like the Jews, right? The Jews are stuck in the old paradigm. They haven't accepted the new paradigm of Christ. And therefore, they ended up rejecting Jesus, the Pharisee. And because they did that, that whole nation fell. And in 70 AD, Jerusalem gets demolished and one million Jews die. And the leaders of the Pharisees, when they sent Jesus to the cross, said, let his blood be on us and to our children. And this is why Israel experiences a lot of tribulations through the ages. Will God save Israel? You know, more or less, perhaps, a lot of the Jews will get saved, but we are now the sp new spiritual Israel. The Christians are the new Israel. You are now the new Zion. Okay? You're the temple. Amen? Jerusalem is the place where the physical temple is, where the altar is. <laughs> Sacrifice is made. And now, you're Jerusalem. Because you're the temple. So you're spiritual Jerusalem, you're spiritual Israel, and you're the altar, and you're supposed to be the living sacrifice. The fire come down on the living sacrifice. Okay, that's how it's supposed to work. Now I'll give you that background, now we're going to start reading. All right. Later on, this is 1 Kings 18, later on in the third year of the drought, so there's a drought. What is a drought to us in terms of today's application? It's like you don't feel God, you know? You're like, I'm trying to pray, I'm trying to read, I'm trying to get close to God, and, and it's just, I just fall asleep. <sighs> I get sleepy, Pastor. I don't feel motivated. I'd rather watch the TV and my phone. It really excites me. I get so excited. You got to force yourself. Just like you college kids, you know, you don't want to study, right? What do you do? You want to get a good gear? You got to force yourself, right? 
You don't go to a teacher and go, teacher, professor, this is really boring material. Right? You force yourself. So the drought can be financial drought, mental drought, emotional drought, family drought, your life sucks drought, you know, all kinds of drought. And the only way to have any happiness is to have what we call the anointing of God, which is oil. When you have oil in the car, run smooth. You don't have oil in the car, you're going to clank, 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 clank. That's how our people rap. I think they're doing like a kung fu move. So that you, you can experience a drought. And so why are we experiencing a drought? That's your question to yourself you need to ask. The Lord said to Elijah, go and present yourself to the king Ahab. Now, King Ahab is one of the wickedest king over God's people. His wife is named Jezebel. If you don't know that name, Jezebel, it means it is, you know, associated with a controlling woman. We don't have controlling women here, do we? We only have controlling men here. All right, but it is a controlling woman, and, and, and some of you know what that means, because uh, when Adam and Eve fell at the Garden of Eden, God's like telling Eve, well, part of your curse is that you're going to desire for your husband because of your insecurity, and you're going to want to control him. And so you're going to want to control your husband because you, you think he's really no good for nothing. And so you got to like, like a puppet, tell him what to do. And therefore, you give up your authority, proper authority within the family, and then more curse comes. What does a woman need to do? You need to get on your knees in prayer and fix yourself. Don't fix your husband, fix yourself. Okay? Fix yourself. We should wrap. Fix yourself. That's how some of you are looking right now. Why wouldn't you fix myself, man? You fix yourself, Pastor. Nihoma. She doesn't really speak English. Tell him that I will soon send rain. Now, understand this. God is telling Elijah to go tell this wicked king, I'm going to send rain. Okay, there is a word spoken. I'm going to send rain. A word is spoken to you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to restore you. I'm going to do some great things on you. So you, a lot of us got some word in your life, I think. Do you just sit there on your couch and twiddle your thumb looking at, the, you know, remote? God said, I'm the man of God. God said, I'm woman of God. You just eating, your butt's getting big. I'm the woman of God, yeah. I'm the man of God, yeah. I'm man of God. I'm the man of God. Weed is legal now. Let's just get high, y'all. We'll wait for God. Yeah, you know, it makes you all mental, right? It makes you deluded thinking you're somebody, okay? So Elijah went to appear before Ahab. Meanwhile, the famine had become very severe in Samaria. Why is there a famine? There's pressure on you when things are not going right because God wants you to open your mind and ask the question, why is this happening to me? Why is my life suck? Stop blaming people and examine yourself. Why is my life sucking right now? <laughs> Meanwhile, okay, verse 3. So Ahab summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of the palace. Obadiah was a devoted follower of the Lord. Once when Jezebel had tried to kill all the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had hidden hundred of them in the two caves. He put 50 prophets in each cave and supplied them with food and water. Five, Ahab said to Obadiah, we must check every spring and valley in the land to see if we can find enough 
Grass, not weed, okay? Grass for the donkeys, not for you smoking purpose. Dirty minds. All right, where are we at? Okay, find grass to save at least some of my horses and donkeys. Six, so they divided the land between them. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. Seven, as Obadiah was walking along, he suddenly saw Elijah coming toward him. Obadiah recognized him at once and bowed low to the ground before him. Is it really you, my lord Elijah? He asked. So Obadiah is a, you know, a, a high-ranking officer, and Elijah is running around, you know, uh, like a poor guy as a prophet, you know, as a, uh, as a criminal as far as Ahab is concerned. But Obadiah recognized the authority on Elijah, and when it says bow down to the ground, it's showing great respect. And the word prophet in the Old Testament means one who has authority for God, who speaks for God. Not just, you know, just because you hear God and if you say, thus says the Lord, does, just because you hear God doesn't mean you have authority to speak for him. Hearing him and actually speaking for him are two different things. If you think you hear God, well, just take it for yourself. But don't go around saying, you know, God said for you to do this. That's another level. And you're going to get into trouble if you get into the wrong, wrong you, know, put, put, you know, out of your boundary. Hey, yes, it is, Elijah replied. Now go and tell your master Elijah is here. Nine, oh, sir, Obadiah protested, what harm have I done to you that you are sending me to my death at the hands of a hole? Ten, for I swear by the Lord your God that the king has searched every nation and kingdom on the earth from end to end to find you. Ahab is the one of the most wickedest king. That's why we can call him a whole king. Okay. And each time he was told, Elijah isn't here. King Ahab forced the king of that nation to swear to the truth of this claim. And now you say, go tell your master Elijah he's here. As soon as you leave, as soon as I leave, the spirit of the Lord will carry you away to who knows where. When Ahab comes and cannot find you, he will kill me. Yet I have been a true servant of the Lord all my life. Has no one told you, my Lord, about the time when Jezebel was trying to kill the Lord's prophets? I hid a hundred in two caves and supplied them with food and water. And now you say, go and tell your master Elijah is here? Sir, if I do that, Ahab will certainly kill me. Fifteen, but Elijah said, I swear by the Lord Almighty, in whose presence I stand, I will present myself to Ahab this very day. 16, so Obadiah went to tell Ahab that Elijah had come, and Ahab went out to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, so is it really you, you little troublemaker of Israel? 18, I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and worship the images of Baal instead. The kings of Israel... At that time, you can think of them as a church, and the king is the main senior pastor. And when they become corrupted, the congregation is corrupted because the congregation is going to believe the pastor, all right? And so you got to be really careful who you want to believe because you can go to any church and they got a cross, they got a Bible, they got their services and they can look you know f formal or holy read some scripture it don't mean nothing if the spirit of the lord's not there the bible in revelations talks about that you know jesus says they're church of satan you know there are actual churches of satan but there are a lot of churches of satan that are amassed as christian churches where the Holy Spirit is not there. All right, 19. But summon all of Israel to join me at Mount Carmel along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who are supported by Jezebel. So when God says, I'm going to send rain, Elijah has to act because there is a reason why God has stopped the rain. Okay? There is 
idolatry in the nation of Israel, that is prevent the rain, the pouring of, of the Spirit. Now, they are experiencing prosperity, okay, prior to that. So because of that, they think, oh, we're good. But they're still lacking. Verse 20, so Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver? Okay, Elijah's talking to the people of God. Today, it is no different. I could be talking to this church, and I could be asking the same question. And in your mind, you could be like, I'm, I'm for God. And I'll be like, no, you're not. How much longer will you play double-hearted Hobbling between two opinions or hobbling between two choices. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. They're silent because they're like, what are you talking about, Elijah? We are for the Lord. When you're deceived, you're not going to go, oh, yeah, I'm following the devil, right? You actually think you're following God. You look at all the other Christian churches out there, they all believe they are in truth. Even the cults, the, you know, the bad churches, whatever, they all believe they're in the truth, right? You need to figure out who's really in the truth. If you don't know the Bible, you're not going to figure that out on your own. You're just going to follow like a blind person. You need to pray, you need to read, and you need to ask God. Who's telling the truth, God? Put me in the church that's telling the truth. And truth is going to hurt. It's going to hurt, and you're not going to like it. You'll probably get offended. When you get offended, you'll be like, I know this is the right church because I just got offended. <laughs> if you don't get offended, you're like, oh, something's wrong. This is a deception church. I haven't been offended yet after six months. And you need to ask yourself, am I hobbling between truth and deception? You think you're in the truth. Everybody does. Okay? Do you know if you're deceived? Because the word deceived means you're deceived. You don't even know you're deceived. Okay? If you're deceived, you don't even know you're screwed. You just think, I'm okay. And you're just heading towards a path of destruction. But you have to read your circumstances, okay? When you're going the path of life and it's not going good, well, what does it mean not going good, Pastor? Well, you read the Bible, let's read the book of Jeremiah and see what, ha what is not good. You read the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8 and see what the curses are, and if those things are happening to you, oh, you are, you are probably deceived. 22, then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left, but Baal has 450 prophets. This word Baal actually means Lord. And so there's people on the internet that says that you shouldn't call Jesus Lord because that word Lord comes this word Baal, Lord. So that if you say Lord Jesus, you're actually calling Baal. It's nonsense. And this word Baal is the God of fertility and prosperity and rain. And so what happens is that when God, so when God sent his people to the promised land, God warned us, be careful that you don't go and start jumping on those gods of the world of pagans and start you know like a dog on a pole he warned us so you have to know oh you have to oh okay i, I better be careful because i can sleight of hand end up serving someone else so Elijah says, bring me two bull crap. 
The prophets of Baal may choose whichever one they wish and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood of their altar, but without setting fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood on the altar, but not set fire to it. Then call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. So the people are like, oh yeah, let's do it, you know, because they thought they were in the truth. 25. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, you go first, for there are many of you. Choose, you, know, you know how you know when you, you could actually be in deception is when you're in a herd mentality, mob mentality. You're going just by the mob or a herd mentality, and you, you're just doing it because you feel safe. You're probably deceived, okay? Because Jesus wasn't, Jesus was like the one guy, everybody else. You got to kind of go against the grain. That's where truth is. Choose one of the bulls and prepare it and call on the name of your God. Do not set fire to the wood. 26. So they prepare one of the bulls, place it on the altar. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, Oh! So they're saying, Oh Lord, answer us. But there's no reply. Some of you... Calling on Lord, he's not answering you. You better make sure who you're calling. Where are we at? Okay. Then they call the name of Bell from morning until noontime, shouting, Oh, Bell, answer us. But there was no reply. Then they dance, hobbling around the altar they made. <laughs> About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. You know, I mock, right? You have to shout louder, for surely he is a god. Perhaps he's daydreaming or taking a piss. <laughs> or maybe he's away on a trip and asleep and needs to be awakened. 28. So they shouted louder. So, it's, you know, like, you need to understand how you pray, okay? And following their normal custom, they start cutting themselves with knives and sword until the blood gushed out. They raved all afternoon until the time of eating sacrifice, but still there's no sound, no reply, no response. They cut themselves. So, you know, when you start praying like this, you, you know, you're praying for something and, you know, you're not getting answered and now you're getting a little pissed off, right? And you're like, God, why are you doing this to me? You know what I had to go through? Look at the life you gave me. Been abused. Been beat up. I got the short in the stick. See, that's, that's, that's like, you know, self-pity party. I, I tied to you and, and, and I'm poor still. That's your perspective because God's perspective is going to be, you tied a few times, but you cheated to me the rest of the time. Ah, listen, God. The Japanese suicide. Ah! <laughs> oh, I got your answer now, God. You don't love me. I'm going to kill myself. You say that to God, you're going to kill yourself. You're not actually talking to God. You're talking to Bell there. Because that's what they do. God not going to answer you that if you talk like that to him. Because then you're making him bow down to your level. And you're forcing him to answer you, and he ain't going to do that, and he's going to stay silent. Then Elijah called to the people, come over here. They all crowded. So, you know, you have the people of Israel, and then you have these, you know, 850 knuckleheads, right? Oh, my God. And so Elijah's like, okay, the rest of the people, all right, all right, my turn, come on over. And they all crowded around him as he pre prepared the altar of the Lord, had him been torn down. He took 12 stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel, and he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons. He piled wood on the altar, cut the bulls into pieces. And lay the pieces on the wood. Now, you're the altar today. Okay? And you're the person crying out to God for an answer. 
And you can, ask, you can actually cry out to God like these Baal prophets, or you can cry out to God like Elijah. All right? You're the altar. You're the living sacrifice. And you want God to come and answer you with his fire. Because that's how God answered King Solomon with fire after the temple was built. Then he said, fill four large jars with water and pour the water over the offering in the wood. So Elijah's like, you know what? I got the altar, pour water over it, right? After they had done this, he said, do the same thing again. Pour more water. And when they were finished, he said, now do it a third time. Let's put some more water. So they did as he said, and the water ran around the altar and even filled the trench. Now it looks impossible. Okay, it looks impossible. At the usual time for offering an evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. There is a difference when you make this up and when God tells you to do it. When God tells you to do it, you're going to have result. When you do it, or when you think God told you and it's not really God, you're going to be like the Baal prophets with no result. Okay? Prove that I have done all this at your command. He's already got foreknowledge on this, what's going to happen. He's not doing this out of blind faith. Okay, let's dig up the trench and please God, they're watching. Please, please. My family's watching. Please, God, miracle. You want them saved, right? You want them saved, right, God? I need a miracle. He's not a crystal ball. It's 37. Oh, Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, oh, Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. 38. Immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven. And burned up the young bull, wood, stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their face on the ground and cried, The Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Then Elijah commanded, Seize these knuckleheads of Baal. Don't let a single one escape. So the people seized them, and Elijah took them and killed 850 of them. Where did fire fall on? How do you know God is in an event? How do you know God is on somebody and as, as validation, they are his servant? How do you know? Fire falls on the impossible. I'll give you a, I'll give you a, a hint. Where's, where's, where's the veils? Oh, are you a sociopath? <laughs> He's a sociopath, by the way. Okay. Where's the veils? <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to talk about Faye a little bit. You know, for those who know Faye, his, uh, his, his wife, not her husband. Faye, the wife, um, for the people who, who are new, so Joshua was a drug and drinking addict for 20 years. I forced him into rehab, took three years. We wrestled, right? And he kicked the, he was able to choose, okay? He chose at the third year, I better stop or I'm gonna lose my family. So he, out of his choice, decided that he needs to stop. And then after he got delivered, we, he, I said, what do you wanna do? He said, I'd like to cut hair. I wanna be Edward Scissorhands. So I took him, sent him to barber school. So now he's Edward Scissorhands. His wife would drive him to the work barbershop and the owner of the barbershop is like watching his wife and like, wow, she's diligent, like making him get up and taking care of her husband and, and it impressed him, okay? And so he made a proposition to her saying, let's do some business together. I'm going to take you in and mentor you. And then he upped the ante and said, you quit your job, 
you come work for me, and I'm going to train you, and I'm going to partner up with you, and I'll take care of all the finances and the mentoring, and we're going to start a business. And now he's like, why don't you move over to Mountain View, because that's where his work is at. And she's like, okay, but you, I need, you're going to have to help me find a place. And he's like, you come live at my house rent-free. I have an extra room. He's married, by the way, okay, so it's, this is okay. He got his own wife. He don't want Joshua. <laughs> Joshua was a little scared because he thought he might get raped over there. <laughs> I told him it's fine. I said, he's fine. He's married. Don't worry about it. So the boss has already taken both of them in. He's giving them enough hours where they can survive and pay their bills. And now he's up the ante again and said, I'm going to give you free rent. And all he want, requires Faye to do is clean up his house. And, you know, we already trained Faye how to clean up. Because that when, first, when first she got here, she didn't know how to clean a licking. And we had elders train her, right? Now she knows how to clean really good. Wax on, wax off. You know, she went through Chick-fil-A at 36 years old, 34, I think. And this owner is telling Faye and Joshua, I'm going to make you into a millionaire. Now, think about this, okay? Jo or Faye had this dream that she wants to do business. And I told her, you know, you know at, at that time, like, you have no ability to do business. But she kept up with her prayer, her reading, and her loyalty to us, to the pastors. She honors us, the pastors. She takes care of us. And fire fell on her. The impossible, as far as some of the people here are concerned. How can fire fall on her? She looked like a troublemaker. Because you don't see what's happening on the... Behind the scenes, you see? Fire fell on her because what happened to her and Joshua is impossible. And that's God's validation. These are my servants. I'm going to tell you something, okay? When we have our revivals, Bishop comes and he told my wife and I, or, he to or, or God told him, he, God told us through him that we shall eat at his table. And the only other person God said that as far as we know so far is Faye. And just because she don't have a title, if she had a title, you should not touch her. Okay, and when I say touch, I'm talking about don't be slandering her. Because God has poured fire on their life. And impossible is occurring. And as long as they do well, they're going to get there. But, you know, it's not guaranteed because they have to keep on doing well. Because sometimes Joshua, you know, he's a little scared. Why are you getting scared? You think your boss is going to rape you? <laughs> you better be more worried about Alex next to you, okay? Okay, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, let's continue. All right, so, word is spoken. Now, listen, to, I want you to understand this context for you and your life, okay? Word is spoken over you, okay? So, word is spoken. I'm going to send rain. What needs to happen before rain comes? The authority of the word needs to gather the sin in your life, which are the Baal prophets. And you need to choose, okay? Because God is saying that some of us, maybe a lot of us, you're playing both fields. And some of the sin that is in your life need to get circumcised. Shall we demonstrate? Junior! <laughs> no, we don't want to see. I'm not saying he needs it, but I'm just playing. Just, just, just kidding. kidding. George is kidding. We can call Elder Sam. You know, he don't look too happy. <laughs> Okay, word is spoken, 
We got to clean out the false word in you. Okay? We got to clean it out and let the fire. So you're going to have to go through something that's going to look impossible. Because two options are going to be given. An impossible option and one that's just going to be having a tantrum to God. God, you got to answer me. You got to pay my bills. You got to do this, blah, blah, blah. That's what most people do, right? You just cry out to God, I need a miracle. I need a miracle. I'm believing in a miracle. Nothing happening in your life, huh? Because you don't know the process. You don't know the process. You want to keep on deceiving yourself, you know, you just keep on. You're getting old, right? Getting old. Joshua, are you getting old? <laughs> Then Elijah said to him, go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Because these false voices now dead, the word that is spoken, that rain is coming. And that could be, that could also represent now you're going to finally get the, you know, overwhelming baptism of the Spirit and the infilling of the Spirit and an awakening. Woo! Ah! See, you guys all need something. <laughs> 42. So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of the Mount Carmel and bowed down to the ground, prayed with his face between his knees. I need to see how that's done. <laughs> Just, okay, you can stay. Word is spoken. Get rid of your nonsense, okay? And you're going to go through some test that looks impossible. So the couple, the couple I had that I dealt with this last weekend that most of you know about, their name is DNR. <laughs> and I wrote it on our forum because they got into a bad deal with the cars they bought. So they went to the dealer and bought a $20,000 Mercedes because your credit's no good. You get charged 28% interest rate. You get charged 28% interest rate, you should walk away. They pay $700 a month now for a 2016 Mercedes. 72 months. Play out the term of the loan, $50,000 for a 2016 Mercedes. I said, get rid of it. So we, I, have, I have them take it back to CarMax. Oops, the dealer. <laughs> After four months of use, they said they'll give them 11,000. The loan is 26,000. You buy it for 20,000, pay taxes 10% and bought a ridiculous $4,000 car warranty. So now you're financing $27,000 car Sticker price is 20000 but the dealer will take it back for eleven. You just got hoes big time, right? So I said, take it back. They said, it'll give you 11000 Now you're underwater, what? $15,000, $16,000. you are stuck. So I thought about it, and I'm like, okay. Well, you know, you know, and this person's like, I need a mentor, Pastor. I need you to mentor me, and I want to become a man. Okay. I need you to give up that Mercedes because that 700 bucks you pay a month can go towards rent because they've been living in the car for three months. And I come to realize that if you live in your car, you have not hit rock bottom yet. You don't know what rock bottom is yet, Americans. You live in the car, it's still luxury. Got the leather seat with the little radio. Turn the engine on, got some heat. Find yourself a little empty parking lot. And you think you you think you you think you're grooving. Here comes the police. <laughs> you haven't hit rock bottom, you still got the luxuries of life. You're like, we're camping out. I said, give up the Mercedes. Start over. I don't want to lose my credit. Yeah, you're not actually starting over. You're going to start in a negative. 
because you're going to owe, we're going to turn the car back in to the bank and they're going to come after you for the difference. I know this. But we're going to start over. They chose to go back to the streets instead of returning the car. Because I gave them a place to live for a while, right? I paid the first month's rent and they decided that the Mercedes was a better deal. Maybe that seat was really cushy. People are just deluded. See, you can't, you know, if you can't give up something, your car, your house, your money, your clothes, your, your, even your wife, your children, when God calls you, the Bible says you're not fit for the kingdom. You're not worthy. And you may still come to church and say, hallelujah. And your life is going down the toilet because you rejected the calling of God. And because you live in America, you think, well, you know, because you're still plump, eating well, you think God is not after you. And slowly you're just going down the sewer. And you pray and you pray and you're losing the anointing because the spirit is like being dissipated because of your disobedience so prayer gets hard reading gets hard and so well you know what you'll do you'll start going on youtube and start watching these you know spiritual people talk about their spiritual jollies so you can get excited again and then you go oh i'm excited <laughs> jesus is coming back tomorrow well, you're still old, sucker. I'm being serious, though. You better wake up. I'm speaking truth. You don't want to wake up. Hey, we can have a race towards the end. See who croaks first, huh? Humble yourself. Start over. That's all we can. You know, you, you know people are too stubborn. You can't, even, you can't even admit you're wrong. Still waiting for God to vindicate you. How long are you going to wait? Hmm? You better just start over. Amen? You want God's help? You, you can't go outside. You know, this is God's kingdom here, in the, you know, whether churches or ministries. And the reality is God's government is a monarchy, not a democracy. And you better understand that structure. If you don't understand that structure, you're going to take it, your democratic mindset and you're going to go try to get God's blessing voted in for you and you're going to just suffer. Because the word comes from the authority, Elijah. Eli it has to come from Elijah. God sent Elijah, God sent Moses, God sent King David, God sent Samuel. It comes from the line of his government, of his authority. You need to listen to the judges that God sends in the book of Judges. That's, that's how it works. It's not like, oh, I don't like you, Samson. You suck too. So we'll go find another leader because that's what they said, you know, in the Old Testament, right? When, when they're following Moses. Moses, you suck. We're going to follow somebody else. And you know what happened? The ground opened up and they all went to hell. There's, there's no democracy in God's kingdom. This is a monarchy. I, he's like, I'm saving you. You need to surrender or you're my enemy. It's that simple. I'm not trying to scare you. You're only scared if you're refusing to surrender. Because some of us still want to smoke our pot. I used to smoke pot for a couple of times. I got paranoid. I used to do ecstasy. All right, 30 years old. 30 to 33 years old, I'm like, oh, I missed. I could have done this when I was 20. I'm not promoting it. Okay, drugs are bad. For some of you who still do drugs, 
Drinking is bad for somebody who's still drinking. The Bible says, you know, just because you use the word wine don't mean you can drink. It says in Proverbs, you know, a king doesn't drink. You want to be a king, an authority, child of God, or you want to be a servant who drinks because you're depressed? You could be the zombie fentanyl guys. I can't move. <laughs> All right. Now, I want you to understand this. Word is spoken. Get rid of your junk. Go through an impossible. Let the fire validate you. And then it's still not over because Elijah got to pray. Seven times, by the way. Right? Seven times like this. Where is it? Uh, face between his knees. Oh, so passed out. Okay, some of you try it during prayer time. Maybe it might work for you. I don't know. Not once, not twice, seven times. And after that, he finally saw a little fist sized cloud. You know, sometimes we tell Lisa, we put her on a diet, and she's, we're like, you have to eat fist size. She's like, whose fist size? <laughs> My fist size or your fist size? What kind of question is that? <laughs> this is why we're not changing. So I'm not going to go. We're running out of time, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. All right? But... The cloud of a size of a fist appeared. The size of a seed. And that's all you need, the seed. But you have to understand from the beginning of the word spoken and to the end what it cost. Okay? And what formed like conception of birth and it grew into a big thunderstorm. You have to understand there's a process. You just get a word from God and you think you can do nothing and like you're waiting for the rest of your life. I thought I was supposed to do something. It's because you didn't read the Bible. To know that there's a process. That there are tests. That your faith will be tested to see if you really belong to his family or not. Because your faith is validated through your action. That's what the Bible says in the book of James. Faith without works is dead. Hmm? No, that's not funny anymore. I use it too much time. <laughs> All right, faith without works is dead. You, you know, some churches, they're like, oh, don't even read the Bible. That's works. What kind of nonsense is that? We shouldn't pray that long. That's works. Get the air out. <laughs> Those are fake people who are the false wannabes that come to deceive you. If you're going to follow Christ and Jesus says, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be one of the difficult things in your life. But at the end, you will harvest fruit of life peace and righteousness. Amen? All right, let's give the Lord a hand. Thank you, God.